Heavenly Father, you are our very great reward. Um, We do not deserve you, but you freely give yourself in your Son to us and in your Spirit. Lord, we are rich because you are our treasure. Father, thank you. I pray, Lord, for us now as we turn our attention to your word that we might marvel at what is before us, that we might know it, understand it. But then even another step, Lord, we, we, we must entrust ourselves to what you say. We must believe and have faith in what you tell us about our lives in Christ. Father, the result of that will be an ever-growing maturity in you, a relationship that deepens because we are experiencing more of your pleasure as we entrust ourselves to you. Lord, may we cast ourselves upon you and your word now. May it speak over us with all of its authority. And may we be humble listeners ready to do what we hear. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up to Romans chapter 6. I think we're going to move through Romans chapter 6 a little slower than I anticipated. It's just so exciting, so good. Romans chapter 6, we'll be looking at verses 3 and most, some of 4. We'll see how far we get. Let me read verses just so you can see the bigger context. I'm going to read verses 1 to 14 and you can follow along. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we might no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We hate to be misunderstood We hate to be the victims of mistaken identity. If if you're just going along in your day doing the same old, very unnoticeable tasks of your very bland life, and then all of a sudden FBI vans swarm around you, FBI agents dive on you, whisk you away, read your, your rights, and thinking all along that you've been money laundering millions for a cartel, Well, that would be a bad case of mistaken identity. You've been grossly misunderstood. It actually could be worse, though. You could have done something actually very heroic, like you foiled a bank robbery in a hostage crisis situation, but then have your actions be misunderstood such that you're actually believed to be the ringleader of the robbers. 
You see, that would be a worse case of mistaken identity because you actually did something amazing, but you were wrongly believed to be the ringleader of the crime. In either case, what you'd need is a good lawyer. You'd need a good defense to clear your good name, wouldn't you? Well, in a much more serious universe, this is actually what happens to the grace of God in the gospel when it saves sinners through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And and it's actually the worst case scenario for grace because grace isn't just minding its own business and then gets mistaken for having done something wrong. Rather, grace is doing the amazing. Grace is performing the greatest rescue imaginable. It's the salvation of a sinner through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. But some careless onlookers are actually convinced that grace is actually a part of the sin problem in that sinner. And so grace gets mistaken, slandered. It is misunderstood in the worst way possible. And what God's grace needs in this case is also a good defense. And that is what is going on in the unfolding gospel argument in Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapter 6 is the gospel's defense of grace from the slander of the careless onlookers who have heard Paul describe grace and what it's done, but is actually convinced grace is a part of the sin problem in us. So Romans 6 provides two gospel defenses of grace, and they are stated, these defenses are stated in the strongest terms possible. And we just read the details of the first one. The first one is found in verses 1 to 14. The second one is found, the second defense is in verses 15 to 23. Now, before we dig more deeply this morning into just the first defense, I want to refresh your memory concerning the the amazing rescue that grace has achieved in the salvation of sinners that is then misunderstood. So a little bit of this is review from last week. When God saves a sinner by grace alone, we know from Romans 5 that God doesn't just see individual sinners and their own personal sin that grace has to overcome in salvation. But God sees you, believer, and he sees your personal sin against him as being embedded together in the sinful mass of humanity. He has to overcome that in your salvation by grace. He has to jackhammer you out with his grace to set you free from your own sin, but from the solidarity with the sinful human race that you've been participating in, enslaved to, and then put you into the new people that he is forming by grace in his son. So your personal experience of the saving grace of God actually rests within the larger work of the same saving grace of God, which powerfully extracted you out from the solidified sinfulness of the human race that had seized you. So, sin abounded in you personally, but the grace of God triumphed where your personal sin abounded. It's the argument being made in chapter 5, but grace did even more an even more amazing feat than that, where sin was abounding in humanity's solidified slab of sin, where all of us were just seized by sin there together. Grace superabounded in the presence of that. And grace didn't come to you personally and exhort you first, listen, buddy, you need to do some good works which will reduce your sinning, and then you'll get some merit from me on that. Your sinfulness just appeared to lie there, present, in the proximity of saving grace, and you believed Jesus Christ. You were declared righteous, and we are told in Romans 4 or 5 that God is the one who justifies the ungodly ones. You were ungodly. You weren't self-reformed with good works. 
You were ungodly. You believed in your ungodliness and God declared you righteous. That's salvation by grace. And grace didn't exhort the entire human race to reduce its corporate sinning first so that it would be easier to save a sinner out of that. Romans 5.20 it's kind of the capstone of all of this, where sin existed, where sin increased in you personally and in us all corporately, grace abounded all the more. And that is where the mistaken identity concerning God's grace can occur. Because here is where poor spiritual sight doesn't see grace accurately or completely. And, and some can become very skeptical of grace because of their misunderstanding of it, because grace can appear to some, if they're not careful, well, that sin and grace actually have some kind of a mutually benefiting relationship. That's expressed in the form of the first question in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Paul asks the question because he's been told this by people who misunderstand grace. Are we to continue in sin just like we used to when we were, when we were in the slab of, of solidarity and sin with the human race? Should we just keep continuing in sin like that so that grace can keep abounding in our lives and increasing? In justification, it is indeed true that where sin or ungodliness flourished in your life, that's where grace in justification flourished beyond it. That's true. And so the false appearance, the mistaken identity concerning grace is, well, then as you walk in your Christian life beyond justification, more of the same would only be good, right? Keep sinning so grace can keep increasing with it and beyond it. That's the mistaken identity. Sin appeared to just go untouched when grace showed up to save you. Grace didn't ask you to reduce your sinning first through good works before you could be saved. To dim eyes, that appears to communicate that grace tolerates sin in the Christian life. And that skeptic's conclusion is actually slanderous and grace must be defended. And so last week we were able to begin the gospel's first defense of grace against the slander of the grace skeptic. Remember, there's two gospel defenses, and we're just working through the first one. So here's gospel defense number one. It's found in verses 1 to 14. It's stated, for the most part, in verses 1 to 2. And it's this. Grace, in no way, is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. The statement is in partnership with sin in the believer's life is taken from verse 1 in the question, are we to continue in sin? Are we just to keep going in sin and have some kind of a partnership in, with sin so that grace can increase? And the in no way, in all caps, is taken from verse 2, Paul's statement, may it never be. It is the strongest repudiation that Paul could use in his language and keep it wholesome. So grace, in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Therefore, if that is true, then grace is against sin in your life. And it has a strategy against sin in your life. And therefore, grace is strategy against sin in the believer, number one, we reviewed this last time, is a matter of death and life for me. It's a matter of death and life. Verse two, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it. So this is review from last time. According to grace, a death has occurred that affects your life, your living. In this case, believer, you are told that you died to sin. Now, death is many things, of course, but one of the most basic things that it is, is it is a relationship changer of the most radical kind. Your relationship to sin, your identity with sin, your position to sin, your loyalty to sin has been fundamentally changed from your side of things. 
That's what Romans 6 is saying. And Romans 6 says that it's your slave status to sin that has been changed. Sin shall not be a master over you, verse 14. Now, sin still thinks the exact same way towards you after your justification as it did before. Sin still treats you the same old way it used to before grace saved you. Sin still pursues you the same old way that it used to before you were saved by grace. You see, sin has not experienced any kind of reform, but you have been changed. You have been changed. Nothing has changed from sin's side, but you died to it. Your death to it changed you. You, believer, were transformed in your position with it, in your loyalty to it. And grace's strategy with your death was this effect. You can no longer live habitually in sin like you used to when you were embedded in the solidified slab of sin of humanity. You see, a death, your death to sin, affected the quality of life you live. Grace's strategy is a matter of death and life for you, believer. And this is the foundation for your sanctification, for your progress and holiness in your obedience. We'll tackle more of this in a little bit. Let's continue on and review. Because grace in no way is in partnership with sin in your life, therefore grace is strategy against sin in you, number two, requires me to investigate and knows, know grace's achievements. We talked about this last week as well. Here we just made the simple observation throughout the chapter in verse three. Do you not know? Verse six, knowing this. Verse nine, knowing that Christ Verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Reckon this, meditate on this, contemplate this, recall it. Verse 16, or do you not know? Verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms, Paul says, because of the weakness of your flesh. That means Paul is putting the achievements of grace on the bottom shelf so you can get them. One of the main reasons a mistaken identity concerning grace even happens is because not enough time is taken to examine and investigate carefully um, so as to truly know what grace has achieved for us. The emphasis is on you must know this. How can you not know this? And this is the case that Paul makes throughout the chapter. The achievements of grace at justification, because salvation was free for you, it cost you nothing in that you did not have to work for it or earn it. That can easily be uh, misunderstood. It can be misinterpreted. And Paul is repeatedly saying over and over again that we're going to have to work a little harder to make sure that we're not drawing too quick of an incomplete conclusion or a distorted conclusion about grace. We can't remain unknowing concerning what grace has truly done for us. Verse 19, the weakness of your flesh will have to be overcome to grasp this. So grace in no way is in partnership with sin in your life. And grace's strategy against sin in you, believer, requires you to investigate, to study, to truly know what grace's achievements are so that you know that the grace of God in your life is actually against your sin, not for it, or intolerant, or tolerant of it. Next, and this is new today, grace's strategy against sin in the believer is rooted in my union with Christ, number three. Grace's strategy against sin in the believer is actually rooted in my union with Christ. Again, we'll just make some um, observations here and notice the frequency of this union with Christ language. Look at verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Um, Verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism. Verse five, for if we have become united with him, 
in both his death and in his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Verse 8, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, and so forth. This is what you must know. Or do you not know this union um, with Christ? Do you not know this? This is what you must know if grace's strategy against sin in your life is to be effective. And this union with Christ language expands on the general statement made at the very beginning in verse 2 that you died to sin. It builds on that, this union with Christ language. And what we find out is that in our death to sin, we weren't alone. We weren't alone. It did not happen apart from Christ, apart from his death. Now, make no mistake about it, as our substitute, as he was atoning for our sin, his death was a lonely death for him. We did not die there with him, helping him atone for our sins. Justification was all about a solo death at the cross. But in our sanctification, our death took place in his death so that our relationship to sin would be forever changed. So somehow, grace united us with Christ at his death, and that is what affected our death to sin. That's how our relationship to sin was changed. And the same argument is made about our union with Christ and his resurrection and the new life that comes with that will Lord willing, get to that next week more so. But when you think, believer, about how you have been changed towards sin, and remember, death is the relationship changer, you now get to see and review how it came to pass because of your union with Christ in his death. Over and over, the statement is made, we were baptized into his death. We were buried with him. We were crucified with him, and so forth. He gets credit in his death for your relationship change to sin. Know this. You need to know this. But even more so, you need to entrust yourself to this believer. You need to entrust yourself to God's wisdom in this. God knows what would change your relationship to sin. And he says it's a death and it is not your solo death over there. And you weren't, Christ, you weren't with Christ in your death like he was standing next to you as you expired. But he put you with him when he expired. And you need to know that and you need to entrust your life to him that that is the effective way to radically change my loyalty to sin. It took that death, me unified with him in that death. Believer, you cast yourself on that God who says that truth about you in your death with him. God knows how to change your loyalty to sin, believer. He knows how to do it. It's in union with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. So grace's strategy against sin in the believer is rooted in my union with Christ. Fourthly, grace's strategy against sin in the believer, number four, broadcasts. Broadcasts my changed relationship to sin through my baptism. Broadcasts my changed relationship to sin through my baptism. Baptism. So here's the flow of thought that Paul has in Romans 6 here. The question in verse 2 makes the issue clear. How shall we who died to sin still keep on living in it? What, what, what's the point? We can't still live in sin the way that we used to when we were in Adam, in that solidified slab of sinful, sinful humanity without Christ. Don't you know that, verse 3? And the proof that is given for why the Romans should know that is what baptism communicates, what baptism broadcasts publicly. Verse 3, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? That is the argument for why the believer can't continue in sin like he once did without Christ in his life. 
Now, we need to unpack this a little bit, don't we? First, what do we know? Just think with me carefully here. What do we know about our current context and our prior context? Uh, back in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul was very clear. Um, By the works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 5, uh, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Verse 6, David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Listen, Paul labored so long and so hard to establish salvation by grace alone through faith alone apart from any works. There is no way to conclude in Romans 6 here that he is now undoing all of that with this statement in verse 3, talking about how your baptism as a good work affected this for you. We need to give Paul and the Holy Spirit a little more credit than that. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Let's think in the broader context of the early New Testament, of the, of the early New Testament church, and talk a little bit about how water baptism in the early church was practiced as the church was being birthed across the Roman Empire through the preaching of the gospel. First of all, think about this. Baptism was a very public activity. You did it down at the river where the community was in the heat of the day, resting where the community was cooling off in the heat of the day, where the community was washing what was dirty, where the community was watering their animals. The closest thing that I was trying to think of in my mind would be like, could you imagine getting baptized in the lobby of a Starbucks at rush hour? Everybody's there. And there you are. Whatever baptism it was in the New Testament, is in the New Testament, it was this. It was the broadcasting of whatever you said in that moment. And it was the broadcasting of what it meant to be plunged under the water and then to be raised out of the water. So water baptism was a very public broadcasting. It was, it was not a private matter. Secondly, baptism was not optional or delayable. If you, if you believed in Jesus or you repented toward him, it wasn't optional to get baptized or not. The church simply didn't have a category in the New Testament for a long period of time for someone to believe Christ, to repent toward him, but not want to go through this very, very public activity, to not broadcast to the public. This is evidenced by the way that Peter spoke to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38. They said, well, what shall we do? as they heard him say, you crucified Messiah. Well, what do we do? What did, Paul, or what did Peter say? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Hardly any space between repent and be baptized. Repentance is not dependent on you being baptized. That's not what Peter is saying. But baptism was one of the first, if not the first expressions of your repentance toward Christ. And it was a very public expression of your repentance towards Christ. If back in that day you heard the preaching of the gospel of God's grace and then you heard Peter say, and repent and be baptized, and you thought, oh, in the Starbucks lobby where all my peeps are, <laughs> they're going to see that. Yeah, maybe, maybe, not, maybe not right now. You see, the early church could not conclude that you had repented toward Christ yet, if that was the case, because basic to becoming a Christian was and is inward repentance toward Christ expressed outwardly, publicly through water baptism. It broadcasts something publicly. 
Third, about baptism. Upon the public broadcasting that your water baptism made, you were then accepted into the local church. You're one of us now. Because you were, you had publicly identified with Christ in front of everybody. You were identified by the other believers as now being one of them. You are now in solidarity with them. And all of the unsaved community at the river identified you as no longer in solidarity with them, but with those people, those Christians. And that's what the New Testament puts forth for all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, Romans 6, 3. Baptism was a broadcasting to the public that your life is now tied to Jesus Christ and to his people. And think about this in terms of what Romans 5 has told us. How could anyone have awareness of or or confidence that you were no longer in that solidified slab of sinful humanity with Adam? How could anybody be aware that you were no longer there? Well, only when what? You were willing to step out publicly from your lost community in repentance toward Christ and publicly broadcast through your baptism, I am in Christ and I'm with those people and I've died with him. In public, somebody said out loud, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or they said, in the name of Jesus Christ. And that publicly broadcasted that you were identifying with Jesus Christ and with his followers, it broadcasted that you were now in solidarity with a new people. Baptism, water baptism, did not achieve that solidarity with them. It just simply broadcasts it. But God designed believer's baptism to broadcast even more to the public than just your identity with Christ that you were baptized into Christ Jesus. But but it was meant to communicate even more. What? The second part of verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, here it is, have been baptized into his death? You see... Our public baptism into Christ Jesus, it broadcasts that we've actually been plunged into his death. His crucifixion is brought right to the forefront of your baptism, that humiliating public death of Jesus. And you are saying that you are tied to it, you identify with it in the most intimate way possible. You you were there somehow. And again, water baptism itself does not effect that. But it publicly broadcasts it, that it has happened. And what this means, get this, this is amazing. What this means is that the believer's death to sin, that change of relationship to sin was planned by God to not be a private matter, but a very public one. I want everyone to know dead to sin in my death with Christ. It's a very public matter. That's God's intention. If you wanted salvation, that grace and the gospel offered in Jesus Christ, you had to, in these early days, and even today, upon faith in Jesus Christ, broadcast through your water baptism, that you died to sin. Your relationship to sin is is fundamentally altered through your union with Christ in his death. There was no way of getting public identity with Jesus and his church in the early days of the gospel without broadcasting that your relationship to sin has changed. 
the lost community that you lived among and that you sinned with boldly in solidarity with them, they would hear your baptism into Christ Jesus broadcast that you were no longer with them and with their sin anymore. God's design was that they would know, that the public would know, you had died to what you had been with them in sin together. You died to that. Your relationship to your own personal sins and your relationship to the common sins of the community that you once shared in, you've been changed to all those things through your death to sin in your union with Christ and in his death. How did they learn and know all of that? Because your baptism broadcasted your changed relationship to sin when you were baptized into Christ Jesus, having been baptized into his death. It did not effect it. It broadcast it. So why does water baptism in chapter 6 come up after grace's break in chapter 5 of your solidarity with the old man and the old Adam and all of those people and your being put into a new people? Why does baptism come up in chapter 6? because it publicly displays to people that that actually happened. It doesn't achieve it for you. Water baptism doesn't achieve it for you, but it broadcasts to people that your solidarity with Adam and all of the rest of the sinful humanity that you used to be enslaved to sin with, you are no longer with them. A death has occurred in your life and you are fundamentally changed toward that sin. Your loyalty to sin is gone. And now you are a part of a new people. How would they even know this? Well, publicly you made a statement when you went underwater and you came out of water and Jesus Christ's name was said. (laughs) And think of how that would actually help the believers in the church to fight against their indwelling sin that remains before you could ever enjoy identity with those people, before you could ever enjoy the public benefits with that people in Christ, you had to publicly broadcast to everyone that your relationship to sin had been fundamentally changed. And you were joining a people for whom that was true as well. That death to sin in Christ's death is the broadcasted proof through your baptism that you are no longer going to continue in sin like you used to with everyone else in the community. Your personal sanctification joins their corporate sanctification and it's a very public matter. So grace's strategy against your indwelling sin broadcasts publicly your changed relationship to sin through your water baptism. And listen, that is true even still in our day, even though there might be a little bit more delay between the time you believed and the time you actually get baptized. So a very good question to ask at this point would be, well, Have you believed Jesus Christ so as to be saved from God's wrath? So as to be forgiven? And if so, then one of the earliest expressions of your repentance must be public baptism. Your baptism does not affect your repentance. Effect it. doesn't make it happen. It demonstrates that it has happened. It's an expression of your repentance that has already occurred. But you need to think really carefully about what broad, what's being broadcast by your baptism. Baptism is not an opportunity for you to get up and tell some really great stories. It's about communicating that 
there has been a radical fundamental change in my life that has separated me away from the people I used to sin with in solidarity. And I am now broken free from that over here, and I want to be with this people over here. And the way that that all happened was somehow God put me with Jesus Christ, and not just with him, in him, but he put me with him in his death. And that death was my death to sin. That's what broke everything away, and that's what sets me into a new people who no longer are going to continue in sin. That's what I want to say about my belief in Jesus Christ. We don't have time to go into the rest of the text here, which goes on to talk about really good stuff like not only were we, did we die with Christ, but we were entombed with him, putting the seal on the death. But then also we were raised with him. There's so much more to say about this. But, but I, wanna, I wanna give you maybe one more illustration to close with that might help drive this home maybe in a different way for you and maybe even whet your appetite a little bit for next week. I don't know how many of you are old enough to even know or what a Dear John letter is. A generation or two ago, a, a Dear John letter was a way for a woman to communicate to her man, and many times he was in the military service far away, and he would get a, a letter, like a Dear John letter, like a, a generic name, like John Doe. Um, and it was her way of communicating to her man that their romance was over. Her infatuation with him was done. The spell she was once under concerning him was gone. Probably one of the worst things that a man could read in a Dear John letter would be for the woman to write, John, I am dead to you. Meaning, like a dead person doesn't respond to stimuli, neither do I respond to the hold you once had on me in our romance. Boy, that would be brutal to read, wouldn't it? It could be worse. And this is what I do for a living. I think of what could be worse. Just ask Smed. <laughs> it's true. It could be worse. Let me tell you what could be worse. If she added to that in the letter, and John, not only am I dead to you, but I'm alive to another man. <laughs> Meaning, that other man, he seems to enliven me. He invigorates my senses and my passions and my thoughts. I'm alive in that man. I'm alive to that man, but John, I'm dead to you. If you ever get a text like that, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and you just need to get some good counseling and move on. But, but do you understand where this is going? Welcome, believer. Welcome to Romans 6. Because do you know what Romans 6 is for you, believer? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, saved by grace, Romans 6 is your dear sin letter written on your behalf by the gospel, by the grace of God in the gospel. Grace says you are dead to sin, but you are alive to Jesus. Listen, this is the best news you could ever have regarding your fight against sin, believer. It's in this dear sin letter that's called Romans chapter six, written on your behalf by grace to sin. Can you claim this dear sin letter for yourself? Listen, today, if you know that you are seized by sin, your sin, if you know that you are drowning in your sin, if you know that you are dominated by sin and you know that the wrath of God is abiding on you, you need to know there is a Savior for you. Jesus Christ. And his grace towards you, sinners like you, is so powerful. It's so overwhelming. Where your sin just increases, his grace abounds even 
more. You must cast yourself on him. You must take everything that you know of yourself and you must cast it on everything you know about him. You have to entrust your life to Jesus Christ, particularly in understanding what his death accomplished at the cross to secure forgiveness of sin and to secure a righteous status for you through faith. You must trust Jesus Christ. And grace will do a number on you so that you can stand in a different stance towards sin in your life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for writing a dear sin letter for us. Lord, we're overwhelmed to think about what, you, what you've accomplished. Lord, I am, I am convinced that I don't understand how bad the sin situation was in me, even how bad sin is in my life as I think on these words in Romans 6, what it took for you to change me towards sin is staggering. And that you would do it by grace, that you would not expect me to put my hand to the tool or to the weapon and break myself free but but to discover that upon faith and being justified by faith alone, continuing to read our Bibles and see that what else you did by your grace is overwhelming. It's such great news for the believer. Thank you for this dear sin chapter. Lord, I pray for any who hear this this morning who for whom this is not true yet. Lord, for a young person in their junior high or high school years, for a mom or a dad, for a husband or a wife who has not yet known and experienced your great grace, oh, Father, would you bring them to their knees today in humility Might you give them the gift of faith that they might pick it up and trust you. That they might be freed from sin. Lord, thank you that as a church family, we can walk together in this. We can help each other. We can grow in our commitment to not continuing in sin together. We can only do this if we know what your grace has achieved and if we entrust ourselves to you in it. Increase our faith. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.